in the New Testament is it verifiable that Christians can be attacked and oppressed by demons? Come on. God used controversy. Look, I'm on the list. He used CNN. He used the media. He used all of it to grow a massive size platform. Controversy built our platform. Two genders. It was never about the controversy. It was never about the politics. But God built our platform for deliverance. We are headed more into seeing prophecy fulfilled before our very eyes. There's a kingdom of righteousness and there's a kingdom of darkness. Something in our being craves something supernatural. If you're addicted to something, you have company. And he said in the last days, the church will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. They will begin to listen to demonic doctrines. He doesn't mind you going to church. He doesn't mind you praising as long as you don't change. There's a great awakening that is coming. The kingdom of God is not about talk. Jesus is king! It's about power and demonstration. The state of the church in the United States, I believe, needs a reawakening of deliverance because of the evil that's going around. Christians can be under the influence of satanic oppression. 100% they can. You see, redemption and salvation is for the lost. The deliverance is to set the captives free. The word of God says, these signs shall follow them that believe. The plan of the enemy is to keep the church quiet. Deliverance is for the people of God. Deliverance is for the church. I'm here to call this culture to Jesus Christ and cast out demons. Because these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Come Out in Jesus' Name is a deliverance movie set to be released in secular theaters on March 13th of 2023. Among those featured in this film are individuals such as Greg Locke, Isaiah Saldivar, Alexander Pagani, Mike Signorelli, Vlad Savchuk, and Leon Dupree. Deliverance ministry is stated by these men to be the greatest awakening in church history. And with that lofty claim, I decided to do a little digging into the history of deliverance ministry and to go back to scripture for clarity and better understanding. And though I have covered this topic in various ways in the past, and I intend to do so in the future, Lord willing, it is good to return to familiar scriptures on the subject and to understand where this teaching came from and its practices. Those who hold to such beliefs will make false equivocations about those of us who call for testing and scrutiny in these practices. They will say we have no experience in this arena and that because we question them, we do not believe in demons or Satan. We must remember, as I will remind us in this episode today, that the core teaching of deliverance ministers today is its exclusivity to born-again Christians. They teach that it is Christians who have indwelling demons needing to be cast out while playing semantics with words and creating levels of demonic influence not defined in Scripture. There is no doubt in my mind I am sure to be called a hater for saying what I will say today, but I say it with the utmost concern for those who would hold to such practices leading only to further bondage. So let's take a look today at some of the history of deliverance ministry, discuss more details about this film, and also discuss another important project coming out this year that has ruffled some feathers in the deliverance camp. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. I want to play a couple of clips for you right now. These come from an episode of the Demon Slayer podcast, and I have played clips from previous episodes that they have done, but this is a podcast that Isaiah Saldivar hosts. On this particular episode, he is on there, including Alexander Pagani, Daniel Adams, Mike Signorelli, and Greg Locke is actually on this one. And they are discussing their ministries and what lies ahead for 2023, which this was recorded on January 3rd of 2023. And the subject of the movie comes up in this discussion. Pastor Greg, Daniel, anything you guys thinking for 2023? We could also talk about the movie right now. There's a full length. This is the first time ever, by the way, we keep talking about historic first time. This is actually the first time ever a deliverance documentary will be playing in 
theaters, secular theaters. How is this happening? How is this happening? Pastor Greg, tell us how in the world are they going to let us cast out demons in several thousand theaters? And we're going to be playing a documentary of demons being cast, cast out, training happening. We'll play the trailer for you guys. But Pastor Greg, tell us a little bit about this movie because this is huge. I don't want to like sweep this under the rug. I want you to catch what he said because we're going to come back to this. The, he mentions that they are actually going to be casting demons out during these showings in these movie theaters and they're going to be training and, and doing all these things for deliverance ministry and it's going to be showing in 2000 theaters to start with across the nation and then they want it they want of course to e explode and go to other um other places other nations that are english speaking as greg lock will expound on here and it's going to be showing for two days and and he'll go into this but i want you to remember that of what is being planned for this and the implications that could happen from from all of this this is a big deal. And when's the movie coming out? Give us some details about it. I first, I never thought they would go for it when we tried to pitch it, if you will, to the people. Now we literally have two or three of the biggest movie distributors that are completely fussing. I mean, they are rolling out the red carpet. And so tomorrow we actually have our meeting at 11 o'clock our time here in Tennessee with Fathom. And those are the ones we believe that we're just going to go ahead and go with, go ahead and sign the deal and the contract. No money up front. I mean, they're willing to foot the whole bill just to get, you know, ticket sales. They want us to do six weeks of pre-sales. And I thought there is no way that this secular outfit is going to go for this movie. We sent them the two trailers that we put out. We got a third one coming out this, I think in like two more weeks, but we sent the two trailers and then uh, a concept of the movie and of course we've interspersed a couple of the guys you know apostle Vagani and pastor mike this past week i got a lot more of them in there but when we sent them the concept they're like you know what this is fascinating and to be honest here's the funny thing it goes back to what i said a moment ago about how god changed me the only reason they wanted to see almost the full concept was to make sure that i was not going to be politically crazy because they didn't wow. know and so once they watched it they're like wow this is nothing like we thought it was going to be. And so they're like, we are all in. And so they're going to start with at least, Lord willing, 2,000 theaters. It's a two-night release. But if we get six weeks of pre-sales that are good, it'll be a two-week release. And wow. I tell people, look, you better look out. Popcorn, Pepsi, and pizza going to be flying all over those auditoriums. Come on. You have to realize that, that Fathom owns Carmike, Regal, and AMC. I mean, those are the three dominating factors in the cinema world all over America. And it is literally going to those theaters. And every one of these guys, and of course, Vlad and others, are a, a valuable part of this film and it is going to be just from start to finish i said look i want it to be one of those movies where when it starts your blood starts pumping and it doesn't quit until the end i mean all no low spots just keep this thing going i wanted people to see it <laughs> apostle Pagani let us see it the other night on the platform real and raw live and in living color and i was like that was the filler that we needed right there boom Come on. you know to fill in some of the blanks because people think we're crazy they're not gonna yeah. think we're crazy when they bring auntie so-and-so to the movie theater to watch this movie about this political man get up there and rant and rave and all of a sudden they find out that we're ranting and raving about the kingdom and you know auntie may falls out on the floor and starts throwing up <laughs> i'm telling you they're gonna find out real quick that there is power in the name of jesus so i don't know what to expect but I'm going to talk with Fathom tomorrow. We're going to sign the contract. So the next clips I'm going to play for you were the the reactions after the trailer was played on this particular episode of the Demon Slayer podcast. So let's see what some of them had to say and the reactions to this trailer. I'm going to say this. This is what I know is going to happen in the movie theaters. They're going to watch this and demons are going to start coming out of people Come in on. the movie theaters. I know it 100%. We're going to see so... Pastor Greg, you're going to see so many testimonies of how and there's going to be people stationed in the movie theater really to, ready to cast out demons we're going to have i would recommend definitely getting people that know how to cast out demons ready in the movie theaters uh, because people are going to manifest and get set free so good i love it amazing pagani what are your thoughts man you just said a minute ago deliverance is a juggernaut it's unstoppable you know a part of me feels bad for the devil feels bad for all the religious <laughs> people that hate deliverance but uh, i don't hate deliverance <laughs> Let me just make that clear. I don't hate deliverance because I understand biblically what deliverance is. And salvation is deliverance for one thing. That is the utmost deliverance that we have as born again Christians. And we're going to get there to the end of this and, and come back full circle to provide you with some encouragement from scripture. Um, but I want you to listen to what Pagani says, because I, I am going to talk a little bit later about something that occurred with Pagani in regards to this movie and to another subject that we're going to get to later on. And this is going to be a more in-depth podcast today, again, talking about some of the history, not exhaustive, but some of the history of modern deliverance ministry, some of the details of this film. And then we're going to get on to another topic here in just a little bit. But listen to what Pagani has to say about this. We're, we are we are pushing this thing like a freight train with the power of God. This is Jesus's ministry. The world has been waiting to see God do this in the earth. And so, man, I, I'm like, I can't even, I can't stop moving, man. I'm so excited about what God is doing. What I think is, you know, what this movie 
you know, um, is going to do, it's going to solidify that the era of deliverance has officially begun. The era of deliverance has officially begun. It seems to be ignoring that deliverance took place throughout the Old Testament by God and showing it to his people and came to fruition when Christ came in his earthly ministry to be the atonement for our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness, to die on the cross for us so that we could have eternal life and be saved from the wrath of God. And deliverance occurred 2,000 years ago on the cross. I'm not saying that these men don't acknowledge the gospel, but I'm saying when you make a comment that this movie is going to show that the, that the era of deliverance has officially begun, you're ignoring the fact that deliverance has already come through Jesus Christ. He is the deliverer. One thing I, I wanted to insert here, and it's something I've thought about for a little while, is you have this teaching in the hypercharismatic church of the signs and wonders, for example, and with deliverance. And people will say, you need to do these things. This is what Jesus did. He is our model. We are to follow his model. We are to do exactly what he did. We're to raise the dead. We're to cleanse the lepers. We're to cast out demons. We're to heal the sick. But he's not our model when it comes to not having indwelling demons. And one of the things I started thinking about with, in particular with deliverance ministry, is you see, for example, in Matthew 4, in the temptation, in the wilderness with Jesus and Satan. And you see Jesus's response to Satan that he said, it is written. Every time Satan said something to him, it is written. And I wonder why they're not saying, well, it, Jesus is our model, which Jesus, to a certain degree, I, I agree that he is our model in humility, in serving, in obedience to the Father. There are certain ways that he is our model, but him being divine is not our model. And him doing miracles that no one else could do. No one has done greater miracles than Jesus, by the way. But the thing is, is that in, when it comes to deliverance ministry, the belief will be perpetuated. Well, you know, on one side of the coin, you're supposed to do signs and wonders. You have to do signs and wonders. You're supposed to do that. If you're not doing that, you're not operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're quenching the Holy Spirit. You are not obeying what God says to do because Jesus is your model, right? But then on the flip side of the coin, when it comes to deliverance, they will tell people you can have indwelling demons and not consistently apply the same rule. I hope that that makes sense because I understand why a demon could not enter Jesus. But I hope that you see the disconnect in using Jesus as the model in this movement and saying, well, he did signs and wonders. But then when it comes to deliverance ministry, it's completely different. It just it seems rather disconnected to me. So let's keep listening to Pagani. And there will be nothing religion, there'll be Come nothing on. politics, there'll be nothing the devil, the kingdom of darkness, witches and war, there'll be nothing that would be able to shut it down. And not only that, this is God's answer to cancel culture. Come this on. This is God's answer to cancel culture. This movie is in the face of cancel culture and what I believe is going to happen, and I'm releasing this as a prophetic word, Come is on. that there's going to be a boldness mantle that's going to be mm. released on the Luke, dry, Christian, fearful, overly seeker-sensitive, hiding behind the scenes in a yeah. Midian cave, Gideon Christians that love the Lord. Acts chapter 4, where they prayed for boldness. And the Bible says, boldness gripped the believers in the church, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I'm telling you, people are not only going to get delivered, but the pastors are going to be infused, yeah. and the leadership are going to be on. infused with boldness. And the fear of cancel culture, its power is going to be broken. And you're going to find, like, they're not going to care anymore about getting canceled and getting, you know, their subs and people leaving their churches. It is literally going to grip them, and this force to be reckoned with the boldness of heaven, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, is going to yeah. grip the church, and they're going to come out of those theaters casting out demons and pr pushing this thing forward and you're going to find that there's going to be a great mantle of boldness that's going to grip the church and we're going to see unprecedented revival hitting all the churches and fr from the movie theaters straight to the church building from the church building straight to the streets from the streets straight to be a global evangelization of the gospel of jesus christ now one thing i want you to keep in mind and i may reiterate this several times throughout this episode as i have in the past please keep in mind what they mean by deliverance ministry and also too i've covered this recently about the full gospel they also believe that the full gospel includes miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, Pagani will, will not say that, to his credit. 
But Isaiah Saldivar and others will say that you must have signs and wonders in order for it to be full gospel. If you don't, it's not a complete gospel. Keep these things in mind because their idea of the gospel they're talking about here is you must cast out demons. You mu- out, of, out of Christians. You must cast demons out of Christians. This is not for unbelievers. This is for born again believers that they believe this. And this is the false dichotomy, false equivocation that I was talking about earlier. To say that we question and want their ministry tested in accordance with scripture and testing experiences in accordance with scripture about this deliverance ministry does not mean that we don't believe in demons, that we don't believe in Satan, and that we don't believe in true biblical deliverance. That is a false equivocation that's being made here, and it's an allegation that's that's unfounded, quite frankly. And if, the, and if people would listen to the opposing side, they would hear that and maybe acknowledge that. So I'm going to play a little bit more of this clip, and then we're going to move on to one more clip from a Facebook post regarding this movie. Mm, I I hope pastors get jealous by the fact that their movie theaters are going to be having deliverance and the churches aren't. I hope some of you pastors watching this where there's no deliverance happening in your church, you keep resisting the Holy Spirit, you keep being stubborn like the Pharisees, you're stiff neck, you keep saying no to deliverance, you keep saying it's not for Christians, it's not for today. I pray that you would be mad and jealous and Paul says, I I did this so that the Gentile, the Jews would be jealous of what's happening with the Gentiles and when you see your local theater break out in deliverance shame on the church when the local theater is having deliverance and the churches are resisting deliverance there's nothing you can do to stop what god is doing this is what jesus started what jesus will finish i just want to echo apostle pagani what you just said i believe that we are in the time of viral deliverance and i will i want to say this personally what god did in pastor greg for deliverance relit the fire in me he's going to go on and talk about how he had started really focusing on deliverance ministry in 2019, 2020. And then he kind of was losing, not really necessarily passion for it, but he didn't want to be known as the deliverance guy. And, and uh, with Greg Locke doing what he did, it really stoked that passion back in him again. So I wanted you to hear from their perspective and to consider what they're saying and test it against scripture. Um, I'm not here to, again, judge anybody, make ad hominem attacks. I'm not here to be hostile. I want to present these facts to you to let you know what's going on so that you can be aware of what's being said, what's being done, what's being produced. And from there, test it against scripture and be praying for this situation. Because my my concern is that people are going to be led astray and deceived by, by teachings that are not founded in scripture. And when we, for example, they mentioned about the Pharisees, Isaiah mentioned about the Pharisees, you know, Pharisees not only broke God's law, they knew the law, they broke it, but they add extra, they added extra burdens to people that they couldn't fulfill. And they, they didn't care about the fact that they were adding extra burdens to them. They were adding oral man-made traditions to them. And the people couldn't even live up to those burdens, let alone they couldn't fulfill the law because it pointed back to their need for Christ. So I want you to keep these things in mind. There is a a social media page that they have things posted on here about the particular film. And so I wanted to play a little clip from something that Greg Locke posted on February 2nd, and it was called What You Need to Know About the Movie. So I wanted you to hear just this particular part. It's a very short clip. It's not the full clip, but I did want you to hear this because he's going to be addressing, you know, the haters and the other ones that have any opposition to this particular movie that's coming out. And so it's really just amazing to me to see what the Lord is doing with this movie. But here's the biggest reason that I want to make this video. This movie is going to answer a lot of questions from what the haters are saying about not our ministry, not my ministry, but deliverance ministry in general. We really take the hokiness out of it. You have to understand that this is a third of the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of deliverance is one of the most ancient New Testament ministries that there is. And what happens today is the same thing that happened in the ministry of Jesus. What new doctrine is this? There's no new doctrine about people under the influence and the oppression and the torment of evil spirits. And there's certainly nothing new about there's power in the name of Jesus over those influential spirits in people's lives. But I want to say this. What this movie is going to do is monumental on many levels. But here's the biggest one. Pastors are going to have to answer a lot of questions. Because people are going to watch this movie. 
even if it's secretly, even haters and pastors that can't stand us are going to watch this movie. It is so theologically sound. It is so embedded in the scripture that you're going to have a hard time trying to deny the reality of just how biblical and New Testament deliverance ministry over evil spirits really and truly is. So pastors, buckle in and get ready because here is what your people are going to be asking. Is the Bible lying or is my pastor lying? Because somebody's right and somebody's wrong. And this movie is going to raise a lot of questions, but also answer those questions. So know this, when it comes to the fact that people in the American church and around the world are absolutely influenced and tormented by demonic spirits, not only is that a fact, here's the greatest fact of all. There is one way and only one to remedy all of it. And it's real simple. Come out in Jesus' name. So we're going to come back to the film in just a little bit and some thoughts on deliverance ministry here later. But in line of this topic, I thought it would be beneficial to look at some of the history of modern deliverance ministry. And we're also going to be looking at scriptures, some of which may be familiar concerning this topic. I believe this is a topic worth discussing because of the implications and the dangers I believe are in these teachings. So with that, let's take a look at the deliverance ministry in historical perspective. There's several articles I'm going to be referring to you today. I'm going to be reading excerpts from some of these articles, and I'm going to post the links to them in the description of this episode. That way, if you want to read them in their entirety, you can. The first article is titled Deliverance Ministry in Historical Perspective, and this was taken off the Christian Research Institute or Equip.org. And these are some of the things it shared regarding the history of deliverance ministry. Quote, early charismatics were the first popular exponents of this new view of spiritual warfare. Many subsequent charismatics have repudiated it. Pastor Don Basham, we'll be mentioning him again in just a little bit. His best-selling book, Deliver Us from Evil, written in 1972, created tremendous interest and notoriety. Basham teamed with other well-known charismatics such as Bob Mumford and Derek Prince to widely publicize this approach. The theology was crude and developed on the fly as the movement grew. As Basham narrates the story, talkative demons lurked behind every bush and the fireworks were spectacular. This version of demon deliverance warfare continues, for example, in the history of Benny Hinn. Members of the other three varieties of demon deliverance spiritual warfare often testified to having gone through a similar stage of fascination with demons and bizarre power encounters, even if they subsequently repudiated the excesses. Dispensationalists developed the second variety of demon deliverance ministry. A pointedly non-charismatic approach arose in the circles around Dallas Theological Seminary and Moody Bible College and Institute. Authors of well-known books include Mark Bubeck, The Adversary in 1975, Merrill Unger, which we are going to come back to him, and another man named Fred Dickison. They both wrote books. Merrill Unger's book was in 1977 called What Demons Can Do to Saints. Uh, Fred Dickison's book was Demon Possession and the Christian in 1987. This variety has a more restrained feel, operating more through private pastoral counseling and prayer than via extraordinary encounters with demons. They articulate their theology more clearly than the charismatics in a style that makes heavy use of biblical proof texts. Bubeck is particularly known for his warfare praying formulas to keep would-be demonic invaders at bay. A third variety arose in what has been called the third wave of the Holy Spirit, centering around Fuller Theological Seminary and the Vineyard Movement. Well-known leaders have included the late John Wimber, C. Peter Wagner, Charles Kraft, John White, and Wayne Grudem, and distinctive emphases include signs and wonders, church growth, and third world missions. This variety is characterized by a more comprehensive and systematic theological rationale that centers on the coming of the kingdom of God and a strong concern for multicultural evangelism. The notion of, quote, territorial spirits, ruler demons that hold entire cities or regions in bondage to unbelief and sin is a recent innovation within third wave teaching. Now, I also read an article. It was on Gospel Coalition. I could not find the year that it was written, but it seemed like it came out of... Um, a journal of some sort that it was in a volume set, but it talked about the evolution of deliverance ministry in Great Britain. And they did mention about the Fort Lauderdale Five. I'll, I'll mention them again. That includes Derek Prince, Don Basham, Bob Mumford, um, five men, of, obviously, that were in deliverance ministry. And so they touched a little bit on that as well in the history, along with some of the others 
that we'll get to, but there's this third way that's talked about, and that's applicable to the New Apostolic Reformation because of C. Peter Wagner. We're going to touch on that a little bit later, too. To get back to the next article, Gospel Coalition's uh, article, there, here are some of the things that I took off of there. When it talks about classical Pentecostalism and deliverance, the um, the author of this paper said, for the most part, these doctrines reverse the earlier teachings of classical Pentecostals who maintained that it was the unsaved, not Christians, who needed deliverance. A significant number of Pentecostal writers have traditionally made a, dis a distinction between demonic possession and demonic, quote, influence, but have categorically denied that Christians could have a spirit which was somehow indwelling. This is clear in the official statement of the General Assembly of the Assemblies of God. Can born-again believers be demon-possessed? Now, this was written in May of 1972, and I want to share this because there has been a change from 1972, as we'll get to in just a little bit. But here's some of the excerpts from this uh, statement that was released by the Assemblies of God in May of 1972. This statement on the question, can born-again believers be demon-possessed, was approved as the official statement by the General Presbytery of the Assemblies of God in May 1972. I'm not going to read all of it to you because it's about five to six pages long, but I am going to highlight to you some of the things that, that stood out to me in reading this. Under the danger of extremes, they say, quote, There is a danger, however, when emphasizing any neglected doctrine to go to an extreme which is beyond the intent of the scriptures. It is also possible to be sidetracked into making the neglected doctrine in the whole ministry. This seems to be the case with some who become fascinated with the subject of demonology. They are trapped into giving most of their attention to it. The more demons they cast out, the more they're seen to be cast out, and the rest of their ministry is practically ignored. This tendency is to become more occupied with casting out demons than with exalting Christ seems inconsistent with the balance of Scripture. Also, there seems to be no basis in Scripture for the accompanying preoccupation with external phenomena, such as vomiting up various substances in connection with the cast out of demons, forgetting that demons are spirit beings. In the one instance in which foaming is mandated, Scripture makes it clear that this was a consistent pattern prior to the time the demon was cast out, and not a phenomenon occurring only at the time of exorcism. They go on in this particular area of the dangers of extremes to touch on the Salem witchcraft trials in the 17th century and how that affected the belief of the supernatural that some people began to ignore and want to get away from that and even operate in superstition. And they said this produced a reaction that would turn people away from all that is supernatural and hinder the work of God. They went on at the end of this particular section to say, quote, a question that arises then is not whether demons are active today, but whether born again believers can be demon possessed, have a demon or need to have someone cast demons out of them. Can the Holy Spirit and a demon dwell in the same temple? Are not our bodies temples of the Holy Spirit? And I got to tell you, when I read this uh, I'm not uh, I'm not a part of the Assemblies of God Church, but when I read this document from 72, there is good solid teaching in here and, and questions that are worth asking. This next section, they say what writers have said. And they go on to cite a, um, an individual such as John L. Nevius, a, Presbytery, a Presbyterian missionary who spent almost 40 years in China. And he saw many cases of demon possession, but never among Christians. And he found that demons did not want to stay in the presence of true Christians. They talked about a pioneer Pentecostal missionary named Victor Plymere, who gave similar insights from Tibet. And he found also that demon worshipers did not find it easy to get demons to take possession of them. And there was a doctor they talked about that told of numerous reports of Christians who apparently have suffered from demon possession, but that he suggested some of them may be in open rebellion against God. Uh, he did believe in eternal security, but he still called them rebel Christians. They also touched on the fact that some believe that demons can possess the Christian's body without possessing the Christian's inner being. And this seemed contrary to the biblical view of the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. It also goes against the biblical view of the unity of body, soul, and spirit as far as responsibility is concerned. According to the Assemblies of God in 1972, they believe that the fragmentation of the person into various aspects was a heathen idea. And if a demon entered any area of the body or mind or attitude, it enters you. Now I want to stop here for just a moment and camp on this because if you put the puzzle pieces together, this is a very interesting thing to consider and to think upon. I don't know what you were taught if you were part of this movement, if a word of faith, um, hyper charismatic or charismatic, new apostolic reformation, whatever area that you were involved in, whatever you were taught. 
I was taught a number of different things over the years, and I was ingrained with Word of Faith teaching, a lot of Kenneth Hagin teaching uh, early on in the years when I was part of the church there. And Word of Faith teaching teaches that we are triune beings, that we have a spirit, we, uh, we are a soul, and we live in a body. And the body is kind of looked upon as uh, disposable. Forget the fact that scripture talks about that, you know, we're, that Jesus told his disciples, do not fear the one who can uh, kill your body, but fear the one who can cast your body and soul into hell. So your body matters. You're going to have a resurrected body. You know, that's almost like a Gnostic type approach to think, well, the body doesn't matter. It's evil. And we really wanted to stick to things that are more spiritual, the spirit being so we can ascend to higher levels, if you will, in spirituality. But the Word of Faith teaching breaks this down into a triune being. And I believe, this is just an observation, if you will, I believe that the Word of Faith teaching is incorporated into deliverance ministry because there is a belief in teaching in deliverance ministry that you can be born again and you can, that the Holy Spirit, it's almost like an apartment complex, really. Like they treat it as if it's an apartment complex, that the Holy Spirit like resides in one part of the, the apartment complex and then a demon can come into the other part of it. And the Holy Spirit, it just like he just compartmentalizes away from from the other parts of your body. And there's nothing in Scripture that supports that. And some people will cite First Thessalonians 5.23 in saying that we are a triune being. And there's also a lot of people that believe that we are um, a dichotomous being, that we are body and soul and spirit you see used interchangeably in Scripture. Now, this is not a salvific issue. Um, and so I believe that some of this is rooted in word of faith and with word of faith being what it is there, there's heretical teaching in word of faith. And so we need to be aware of this and consider this. And also let's mention the fact too, of scripture talking about Jesus says the first commandment is to love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with, with all your soul, with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself as the second commandment. That is essentially showing and telling us we are to love God with, with every part of our lives, every part of ourselves. Why would the Holy Spirit compartmentalize into your spirit and call your body the temple of the Holy Spirit? And I know Isaiah doesn't like people using uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 and, and then the, um, the context of it, but it still is saying that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are to glorify God in our bodies. And whether he likes it or not, that's what scripture says. God views our body as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why would he cohabit with a demon in a born again believer? Something to think about. As we go on into this statement from the Assemblies of God in 1972, this reminds you, they talk about that uh, many Christians have had God given deliverances from problems and believe they were delivered from demon possession. But we must search the scriptures to see if their interpretation of what happened is really in line with what the Bible teaches. And they say a serious danger in considering all these sins of disposition, which their argument is just because something says a spirit of fear, or a, but a power, love, and a sound mind, that if you're going to say someone has a spirit of fear, then you need to also say that they have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. When their argument in this paper is, when you say a uh, spirit, that that's attitude or disposition, that it does not equate to a demonic spirit. So they're saying is that it's a serious danger in considering all these sins of the disposition to be demons, um, that, that the person may essentially uh, evade responsibility for personal actions and feel that the necessity for repentance is removed. And when the Bible calls people to repent of these things and to put off these attitudes, the great conflict within us is not between the Holy Spirit and demons, but between the indwelling Holy Spirit and the flesh. That is all the sensory apparatus that tends towards sin. They acknowledge that not all sickness is caused by a demon. Um, they cite such passages as Matthew 4, 24, Matthew 8, 16, Matthew 9, 32 and 33, Matthew 10, 1, Mark 1, 32, Mark 3, 5, Luke 6, 17, 18, and uh, Luke 9, verse 1. And they say in none of these examples is there any indication that any of these sicknesses caused by demons were of people in right relation to God. We must remember also that all of these examples took place before Pentecost. 
They also point out in their statement another great problem with the idea that demons possess Christians is that a concept that erodes faith and waters down our concept of God and the salvation he provides. God is our father. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And in this darkness we used to live when we followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdoms of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But now God by his love has saved us and has made us fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. It it would seem contradictory for demons to indwell our bodies now that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And they, they continue to go on and talk in here. And I want to skip down to where they say resisting evil forces. They say, quote, the Bible does show that Satan and his cohorts are external foes. We are in a warfare against Satan's forces and they are looking for opportunities to attack us. See Ephesians 6, 12. The biblical emphasis is on we must face in our, the very atmosphere around us. The call is never for us to get someone to cast the demons out of us. They are out there attacking us, testing us, not possessing us. The call is to be vigilant and to put our armor on and take our stand, as in stated 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, and 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. They conclude their statement with saying Paul sees in himself and in us the living presence of Christ as the only hope, referencing Colossians 1, chapter 1, verse 2 and 29. And they say, our redemption is a redemption of the whole person. The full price has been paid. Christ's enemies accused him of having a demon. It is a subtle trick of the devil that makes sincere people accuse Christians today of having a demon. Clearly, there are deliverances, but calling them deliverances from demon possession is unscriptural. Now, it's a great article to read. It's a great statement. What is interesting to know and you may not be aware of this, but as of 2019, the Assemblies of God actually gotten rid of this statement. They've completely changed their stance. Um, they adopted this on July 30th of 2019, the spiritual warfare and the believer. They talk about spiritual warfare in the world, spiritual warfare in the flesh. They talk about spiritual warfare in the devil. They talk about pastoral implications. And so again, I'm going to post the link to this. And so you can read it for yourself. When they get to the section of talking about spiritual warfare and the devil, they have this to say about the believer and, and demonic forces. Quote, the conflict between the believer and demonic forces can be understood as a spectrum of demonic influence ranging in the degree of domination over a person's life and in the variety of aspects of life where demonic control has taken place. The impact of demonic powers may be slight and almost undetectable. If one repents, forsakes their sin and carnal activities, resists temptation, and calls upon the spirit to cleanse and deliver, victory and freedom will be obtained. The extreme influence of the demonic could be called possession, in which a person is controlled by demonic forces who manipulate the individual's body, mind, and spirit for their destructive purposes. This extreme case of demonic control is indicative of continued movement away from and abandonment of a personal relationship with Jesus. The believer should gain victory in the spiritual conflict well before this extreme and not be subject Subject to it. While believers will engage in spiritual warfare and will be oppressed, they cannot be possessed by the demonic forces. It seems co contradictory when you read it because they're talking about the conflict between the believer and demonic forces. And it almost seems like the extreme cases they're talking about where people can be possessed, I, I don't know what their view is of of eternal security or salvation. Um, so it's very different than what they said in 1972. And because you, you can no longer find this statement on their website from 1972, this one has replaced the one from 72, the one it's in 2019. And they've gone into more detail. There's some things that seem very similar to 72, some things that they've not changed their stance on, but it's, it would appear that their stance on can Christians have indwelling demons or be possessed. And I know that deliverance ministers will say that they don't believe that the believers can be possessed. There's a, um, a, a spectrum of teaching is what the Assemblies of God talks about. And I was taught this as well, that there were five different levels of demonic influence. And the ultimate one was possession, and they and we were taught that Christians could not be possessed by demons. But yet, when you hear this teaching being taught, they're casting out indwelling demons. And so, and then they'll try to use the Greek word daimonosomai to say, well, it, it could mean um, demonized, but that's an English understanding that was adopted into, from what I've read in these articles, that was, it was more than one article that I read that, that it said, unfortunately, that the, the definition has been watered down, that it did mean 
possession, um, infl- like possessed by a demon, as opposed to just being demonized. And so that's how they kind of play the semantics game, it sounds like, to get around and saying, well, you know, Christians can be demonized, meaning they can have an indwelling demon. So I wanted to share that from the Assemblies of God. And so you can read that more fully if you'd like. As far as some of the information I got from Gospel Coalition, and again, a lot of it had to deal with the deliverance ministry evolution in Great Britain. But here's some of the things that they shared further as we get back into that article, um, talking about the, the great Pentecostal revivals of the early 20th century. They said the major bodies came out against the practice of deliverance for Christians. One of the first struggles of the early Pentecostals was against the teachings of Jesse Penn Lewis, who befriended one of the great leaders of the Welsh revival, Evan Roberts, and was denounced and banned by the Pentecostal churches. The publication amounts to a detailed account of how the demonization of Christians occurs and includes a graphic description of the infiltration of various parts of the physical body. Uh, Pentecostals viewed it as a power encounter with pagan religions and unbelievers. This was mentioned in this article as well. And the the author said the Pentecostals opposed those on the fringes of the movement who claimed to have a specialized ministry in deliverance. And the reason for the emergence, according to this article, was because there were very few doctrinal statements clarifying demonology and exorcism, with the exception of the book Foundations of Pentecostal Theology. To my amazement, when I read this article, uh, I had a moment of remembering this book because it was sitting on my shelf as I had it when I was in, quote, Bible college years ago at the church that I attended. And so I went through this book because it talked about Satanology and demonology, and I wanted to see what it had to say on the matter. So I turned to the pages where it talked about it and highlighted some things that I wanted to share with you. On page 487 of the Foundations of Pentecostal Theology, Regarding demon possession as contrasted with demon influence under the letter D, subheading letter D. Uh, Talked about demon possession and demon influence. In the former, the body is entered and a dominating control is gained. That's for demon possession. While in the latter, a warfare from without is carried on by suggestion, temptation, and influence. These must be the fiery darts of the wicked, as noted in Ephesians 6.16. On letter E subheading for this, as opposed to sickness, the scripture makes it very clear that all sickness, though originally the result of sin and Satan, is not caused by demon possession and is not an indication that one is possessed. Thus, the practice of some who are ministering to the sick always try to cast out a demon is not biblical procedure. That would be worth reading again, but we have too much to go through today. But yes, so, and again, this is from the Foundations of Pentecostal Theology that was written in the 80s. This is to show you that there were some some sound teachings that were coming out of the Pentecostal theology. Now, I don't agree with everything that they believe, but you can see here that there's some things that we would say yes and amen to those things. They talked about on page 488, it should be noted that Jesus laid hands on the sick, but he rebuked the demons. And then they go on to talk about demon possession today, citing some of the similar people that I've already talked about, such as John Nevius, who was the Presbyterian Chinese missionary. On 491 in this book, still sticking with the topic of demonology and demonization and demon possession, they say there is nothing either in scripture about coughing up or spitting out demons. A demon is a spirit and as such is invisible, nor are we given any encouragement to hold conversations with demons. Does any of this sound familiar to any of you all? Because I could probably cite no numerous uh, examples of people doing these very practices today. And yet the Pentecostal theology book here does not support that teaching or that practice. They go on further on this page saying, quote, nobody manifested a ministry exclusively for dealing with demons. This would draw attention more to Satan than to Christ. Preoccupation with this fear of things is a kind of tribute to the power of Satan. At the bottom of this page on 491, the foundations of Pentecostal theology, they say, quote, again, method must not underestimate the power of the word of God. The preaching of the gospel is deliverance. It is the power of God in itself unto salvation. In, and in parentheses, they have deliverance. It could well be that great conversions are sometimes straightforward cases of the word of God overcoming Satan in a man's life. It would be absurd to think of a great conversion of a man leaving him with demons still in his heart. Can a man be saved through faith in the gospel and then need a second experience to save him from Satan? From what was he saved in the first instance? The anointing breaks the yoke. If you have this book, I think it'd be worth checking out just to read some of the 
his, from a historical perspective on what the, the Pentecostals believed as far as the, and theologically as far as demons were concerned and demon possession in Christians. Now, as we go back just a little bit more into uh, the Gospel Coalition article, and then we'll get to the next few articles I want to touch on. Pentecostals continued deliverance teaching in the 1930s and post-World War II, and they mentioned some individuals with that. And some of the ones I want to mention here that may be familiar to you, A.A. A. Allen, um, 1911 to 1970 was his lifespan, who was perhaps the most strident Pentecostal of the 1950s and early 1960s, and whose demonology appears to be close to that of the Latter-day Reign movement that arose in the USA in the late 1940s within Pentecostalism. Allen wrote copiously on demonic oppression and possession and advancing the idea that Christians could have a demon. It became fashionable in his churches to talk of spirits with particular attributes such as jealousy, lust, and anger. Allegedly, Allen even spoke of the spirit of nicotine. This all gave a lead to the modern charismatic movement's concern with demons associated with specific conditions and maladies. Oral Roberts was the pioneer of slain in the spirit in deliverance. William Branham also participated in deliverance, claiming to see auras around those who had illnesses associated with demons. And as we go on, I mentioned the Fort Lauderdale Five a little bit ago. This was a group of individuals largely from a Pentecostal background who came together. And as I mentioned, Don Basham, and in the book he wrote, he argued, like many others since, that the perception of the need for the deliverance of Christians came through the experience of those with a healing ministry. Derek Prince was another member of the Fort Lauderdale Five. According to this author, he is probably the most important figure in furthering the demonology behind deliverance. Prince had pioneered a belief in the hidden prevalence of witch witchcraft in the USA and spoke of demons as disembodied spirits trying to control human beings and of dark angelic powers attempting to dominate churches, cities, and other geographical areas. These, teacher, these teachings corresponded with those of Peter Wagner at Fuller Seminary in California where John Wimber taught. Prince has also been largely responsible for developing teachings of ancestral spirits and the alleged demonic implications of self-curses, generational curses, and soulish prayers through his very influential work, Blessing or Curse. Prince's teachings also overlapped with those of the non-charismatic theologian Dr. Kurt Koch, who had a considerable impact on the emerging charismatic movement with his work on deliverance and the demonic origins of much mental illness. Koch had attempted to show beyond dispute that involvement in the occult could produce dire emotional and spiritual effects to the third and fourth generation, with the implication that Christians were also susceptible. This article went on to say deliverance gradually grew as a practice in the charismatic renewal movement, both within the mainline denominations and the end independent house churches. Often it was perceived by charismatics as being all part of the present moving of the spirit and the renewal of the church. At the time, it coincided with the wider interest in divine healing by Catholic and Protestant neo-Pentecostalists. Within the charismatic churches, there were also Christians claiming to experience demonic oppression, very often because of pre-conversion involvement in the occult. Finishing up from the Gospel Coalition article, there were a couple others I wanted to touch on, and then we're going to go on back to the movie. I know you're probably wanting to, to talk about that, so but I think it's, like I said, it's very important that we touch on this. There are two other articles I wanted to share with you. I'm sure that there are plenty others, but I wanted to gather some information that may be helpful, again, to, to understand the historical aspect. There is an article that was written in the Asian Journal of Pentecostal Studies in the year 2000 by Stephen Carter, and it's titled Demon Possession and the Christian. And Stephen Carter covered some of the people that we've mentioned before, Mark Bubeck, Fred Dickison, Kurt Koch, Merrill Unger, C. Peter Wagner, and saying that they all gave numerous examples of born-again Christians who have been diagnosed as suffering from demonization. He said the official assemblies of God position, on the other hand, has rejected their view and maintains that it is not possible for Christians to be demon possessed. Like I said, this was written in 2000. So it was before it was uh, 19 years before the assemblies of God refer reversed their beliefs on that. Carter goes on in this article to refute this belief, pointing to scripture, also pointing to the Greek terminology, such as diamonosomai, mentioning that that a lot of these that um, support uh, deliverance ministry prefer to use the term demonization. And his point in this is that the original word, as I said before, um, has been made to mean something else. And he, he like I said he talked a lot about the specific aspects in their beliefs and what they concluded. 
in his, in his conclusion, I did want to read this. He said, uh, we have seen how the term demonization has crept into the English language. While it is based upon the Greek verb daimonosomai, its original meaning has not been retained in its current usage. Consequently, it is a misleading term and should not be used in place of demon possession. We have also identified the faulty anthropological view held by those who believe in the demon possession of Christians. A human is not composed of various independent parts which can be inhabited separately by the Holy Spirit and demons, but is a unified and fully integrated whole. Any biblically based theology must recognize and build itself upon this. He concludes with this. If the demon possession of Christians is a reality, why is the New Testament silent on the subject? Why is there not one reference to the reality of this threat? Or did the New Testament writers not see it as a threat? The only answer which seems reasonable is that the New Testament writers did not see the possibility in the first place. This last article is 25 pages long. And no, I am not going to read you all 25 pages. But this is an excellent article. And I was happy to find it because I actually have a book written by Robert Dean and uh, the co-author's last name was Ice. They wrote a book about spiritual warfare years ago. And it was one of the books that I got my hands on when I first came out of this movement. It was so helpful for me to understand and process some of the things that I was calling into question and wanting to understand from a biblical standpoint. He had this article that he wrote. It's called Demon Possession and the Christian. And he talks about it from the historical developments. Um, he talks about, the, and he says, the purpose of this paper is to analyze the biblical arguments for Christian demon possession against the backdrop of studies since the mid 20th century. And he refers to the advocates of this as neo-spiritual warfare. So if you hear NSW, that's who he's talking about. He mentions about that the Roman Catholic theology maintained the possibility of demon possession of the believer, and this is primarily due to concepts in Roman Catholic soteriology that make it impossible to have certainty of salvation. And as he went on to talk about the historical developments, he said, quote, in the 20th century, deliverance theology found a home in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. By the late 1970s, deliverance teaching became one of the several bridges which brought traditionally non-Pentecostal charismatic believers into the orbit of classic Pentecostal teaching. Historically, segments of classic Pentecostalism practiced deliverance ministries, including exorcisms, and held to the belief that Christians could be demon-possessed. Though some in the Assembly of God rejected the teaching that Christians could be demon-possessed, many did not. In the charismatic movement, also called Neo-Pentecostalism, or the Second Wave, disagreements arose over this issue. Some leaders of the Christian growth movement, such as Derek Prince and Don Basham, held that Christians could be demon-possessed, others that they could not. The teaching of Prince, Basham, and others influenced John Wimber and Peter Wagner, the founders of the Third Wave, otherwise known as the Vineyard or Signs and Wonders Movement. And some of us know those names very well. Dean went on to say until the 1960s, non-charismatic churches traditionally held to a theology that rejected the demon possession of the Christian. This was most clearly articulated in Merrill Unger's Biblical Demonology, where he presented a strong biblical case based on the study of Scripture that Christians could not be demon-possessed. Now, I've mentioned this name already, Merrill Unger. His original book written in the 1960s contradicted this belief. So he came out saying, no, Christians cannot be demon possessed. Well, in this article, Dean discusses how authors such as Unger and Dickinson changed positions based on experience. So they had missionaries reaching out to them after, for example, with Unger, after his first book, De uh, Biblical Demonology, he had missionaries reaching out to him and telling him he was wrong because of their personal experience. So then he began to do his own case studies and he came to the conclusion, well, the Bible wasn't really clear that there were kind of fuzzy areas on this, and, but that the experiences seemed to fill in where the Bible was, was silent on this. Dean says it here in this particular section. He says, to summarize this position, we see Dickinson and Unger claiming that the scriptures are fuzzy and that God has not sufficiently clarified the issue of demon possession. Man is left to his own resources to determine the answers to this important question. As Robert Dean goes on in his article, he touches on going back to the scriptures to understand it and making sure that the scripture is our foundation from what we're to rest upon and that our experiences do not interpret scripture, but that scripture is to interpret our experiences and to test our experiences. And he goes on to say, from the third to the 17th centuries, definitions of demon possession were based on human experience or human experience plus the Bible, not on the Bible alone. So this is not a new thing as far as gauging personal experience 
as the foundation of truth. This has been going on for for hundreds of years. He brought up a point that I thought was really fascinating and and interesting to note. He mentioned about how uh, Merrill Unger noted that the possessing demon will voice opposition to Jesus Christ. And Robert Dean points out, no possessing demon in any of the biblical cases speaks derogatorily or blasphemously of the Lord. On the contrary, the possessing demons seemed compelled to announce who Jesus is and to perform obeisance to him. Citing several scriptures such as Mark 123, Mark 311, Mark 57, Luke 434, Luke 828, and Acts 1617. I encourage you, any scriptures that I'm referencing, that you please look them up and study these in your private time to make sure you have better understanding of these. In the latter part of Robert Dean's article, he talks about six arguments against demon possession of a Christian that I found interesting, and I wanted to list these to you. The first one was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He talked about the Greek word used for the temple of the believer's body is naos rather than hieron. The significance is that the inner sanctum or holy place, naos, is the point of comparison rather than the entire temple complex, hieron. Access to the holy place was restricted and nothing evil or unclean was allowed to enter there and coexist with the dwelling of God. And he talks about a further uh, illustration can be gleaned from the analogy of Israel's organization as they encamped around the tabernacle. As is frequently the case, events in the life of the nation Israel portrays issues in the life of the individual Christian. The nation encamped around the tabernacle is analogous to the body of the believer. Sin could exist in the camp, though it was disciplined by God. The nation itself is indwelt by the glory of God who is in their midst. This is analogous to the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, inside the believer. But nothing defiled or evil could enter that temple. In the same way, the believer has been set apart as undefiled, a temple for the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. Nothing can defile that inner sanctum. No spirit can enter and desecrate the holy place. The second aspect he talked about the arguments against a Christian having an indwelling demon was an empty house. And this was citing uh, Matthew 12, especially 43 through 45. We know these passages well, the whole, that account there, Matthew 12, 28, 29, 43 through 45. And there are some deliverance ministers that will cite that. So I encourage you to look at that. Obviously, the house of a believer for the Holy Spirit is not empty. And this was stated before Pentecost. Number three was intercession of Jesus, and he um, quoted John seventeen fifteen, where Jesus is praying the high priestly prayer to the Father and saying, keep them from the evil one. And this is talking about protecting believers, and he mentions about how this would have been a vacuous prayer for Jesus to pray if, if believers were not protected by God. Why, on, why would he pray that to the Father if that would not be the case? Number four was kept from harm. And so he elaborated on that a little bit more. Again, I will have the link to this so you can read this article. It's an excellent article. I think it'll be very helpful. Number five, protected from the evil one. And number six was arguments from sufficiency and silence. In scripture, which this is a, a, a valid argument because scripture is silent when it comes to this issue of Christians having indwelling demons or being demon possessed. So now that we've taken a look at some of these articles, let's get back to the matter at hand today with Deliverance hitting the big screen. So I wanted to share some of the things with you I found out about this movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name. I found this on one of the websites on marcustheaters.com. The release date for this is March 13th of uh, this year, so next month. It's listed as a drama, and the rating is to be decided. It said some content may not be suitable for kids under the age of 13 and could include strong language, stronger sexual situations slash dialogue, including nudity and violence. Parents are cautioned about kids under the age of 13 viewing this content. The runtime will be two hours and five minutes. The director is Eddie Lambert and starring, it says, Daniel Adams, Greg Locke, Ty Locke, Isaiah Saldivar, Alexander Pagani, uh, Vlad Savchuk, Mike Signorelli, Leon Dupree, Henry Schaefer, Chiara Clark, and Hudson Locke. And here's the synopsis of this movie that I wanted to read to you. Quote, following a startling chain of events, the most controversial pastor in America, Greg Locke, 
took a 180 degree turn from his mainstream religious traditions and led his church to the brink of revival. He and a diverse group of unconventional preachers then began to spark the most important awakening in the history of the Christian church through the most unlikely means by casting out demons. This fiery film documents the beginnings of their journey. Come out in Jesus' name will be followed by a live simulcast event where Pastor Locke and his fellow demon slayers will lead a supernatural mass deliverance in Jesus' name. So there is a statement at the end of this poster and even in here that I want you to take note of. It says the most important awakening in church history has begun. I want you to consider the implications of that statement. Is, is that true? Ask yourself, is that statement true? That what they are doing, what they, what they are saying this is, this is the most important awakening in the, in the history of the Christian church. Is it? Is this the most important? Is this more important than what took place on the day of Pentecost with the preaching of the gospel and salvation being proclaimed and the inception of the church? Is it more important than that? Has God been incapable of building the church over the past 2,000 years because of a lack of deliverance from demons? And so now, all of a sudden, the most important thing to happen in the history of the church is now taking place? So just consider that question. And there is one more observation I would like to make. I recently noticed that tickets to this movie were sold out in a particular area where one of these ministers is located. And I recalled in the Demon Slayer podcast that they were telling the churches they pastored to buy tickets to this movie and to pack it out because they want the viewing to be extended to two weeks and they want it to go further. And so I wonder from a spiritual standpoint why you would have individuals you shepherd to attend a movie where you are claiming people will be delivered of demons. Now, I know that they're saying that they want people to be trained and to cast out demons, but why would you have your own people buy tickets to a movie that you want to see demons cast out of? Are these individuals not walking in freedom because of the teaching they sit under, or do they still need demons cast out of them? Is a question that I would like to consider asking, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way or in a, in a belittling way, but it just makes me wonder. And there's going to be a simulcast to do mass deliverance in these theaters, and I want you to consider the potential for chaos that could ensue, and if the gospel will truly be ministered, and if potential new converts would be discipled in solid biblical churches. This is something else to consider, because you can say all you want, well, the gospel is not just in words or talk, but it's in power and demonstration. And I would argue that that is a gross misunderstanding of the passage of scripture, and it's denigrating the power of the gospel itself, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and the miraculous power that God extends to those who are spiritually dead, and raising them to new life in him alone by their faith in Christ to save them from their sin. From, because of his atonement on the cross. I think that, that that has been missed. I want to give the benefit of the doubt and think that's not what's intended. But when you say there must be physical demonstration, something that I can see with my own eyes in order for it to be considered power, then I think that there is a misunderstanding there. The power is in the gospel, and the gospel does not need signs and wonders to accompany it. And the sign and wonder... The sign is Christ rising from the dead. That is the ultimate sign. And the fact of us being saved and being brought to eternal life to and newness of life and being the, and the promise of eternal life to come, that should be enough. <laughs> if we have to add something to the gospel for it to be powerful and we think it's in our own means to do it and in our own abilities, even if we don't think that, but that's what we're projecting and we're saying— then then there's error involved in that. And, and that's the concern I have. And then to say that you're going to cast demons out of people, are you going to disciple them properly? Are they going to be properly biblically discipled? Are they going to understand what it means, what salvation truly beyond that now and what sanctification is and, and be led in understanding scripture properly. And, you know, there's a lot of different moving parts there that need to be considered. This is not just, well, let's just uh, blow in and blow up and, and blow out, you know, with this whole movie or anything like that for that matter. And then to be very cautious when the world likes something that we're doing. It doesn't mean that we're trying to go around finding something that the world doesn't like us doing. But when the world gets excited about something like this, 
and surely to goodness they will because of the supernatural being involved, then there needs to be great care taken in that because if the world likes what you're doing, then you need to be, and it's popular, you need to be looking at making sure and testing it. Um, I want to switch gears in this episode and to discuss um, another film that's or docuseries actually that's coming out in the spring of this year, I believe. It's planned to be coming out in the spring of this year tentatively. And that is the American Gospel Spirit and Fire. And some of you may be familiar with it and some of you may not. And you may be wondering why I'm even bringing this up. And the reason why I want to discuss this is because it was brought up by one of the individuals involved in this deliverance movie. And I wouldn't have brought it up otherwise, but, and I debated on if I even wanted to talk about it. And I thought I can talk about this without being hostile. But the reason why I wanted to talk about it was because I'm actually one of the individuals featured in American Gospel Spirit and Fire. And so I wanted to talk about this a little bit and and what transpired. Now, this post you're not going to find on social media because he took it down. But there was a post from Alexander Pagani, who's one of the demon slayers. And he posted this on February 1st of 2023 at 1043 a.m. And I believe earlier than that was when it was on that same morning on that Wednesday morning when the extended trailer came out for American Gospel 3 Spirit and Fire. It came out that morning and then shortly after Pagani posted this. And this is what his post said. Quote, our motion picture on deliverance is our response and public rebuttal of the movie American Gospel bloviating against charismatics. Clap back. And he had six exclamation points after the clap back. Um, And so I just want to say this is not a clap back, but but this will bring some clarity. (laughs) So I wanted to talk about this and to provide some insight to you, especially with those that may have seen that Facebook post and you wondered, what does it even mean? What is American Gospel about? Because this is the third installment of this film to come out. The American first one was American Gospel Christ Alone. The second one was American Gospel Christ Crucified. And neither one of those films even touched on the subject of deliverance. So I do believe that this is directed towards the third installment that's coming out. So let's talk about it a little bit. So, and this comes straight off the American Gospels website. So you can go, you can fact check me on this and, and read it for yourself. And there's more detail to read, but I'm pulling out some of the pertinent matters in this so you can better understand what's going on. So the synopsis of American Gospel Spirit and Fire says this on their website. In Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Today, many in hyper-charismatic circles use this verse to teach that Christians should pursue a baptism of fire from the Holy Spirit. These encounters with the presence of God typically manifest in bizarre ways, including a loss of self-control, dignity, and other mystical experiences that are untethered from Scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. American Gospel, Spirit and Fire, will examine the true person and work of the Holy Spirit, including his work in the life of Christ and his followers, and contrast this with the different spirit commonly promoted in the movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation, or NAR. So under the release date on this page, when it talks about the frequently asked questions and then the production blog, under the production blog, they have some things under the release date. Now, I want to share this one thing with you. They remind us in the release date uh, information, it says, keep in mind that this project started in 2019 and will be released in 2023. So this project has been going on for five years. I don't know how long Come Out in Jesus Name has been going on, how long they've been documenting this. Um, But this project in particular has been going on since 2019. And this is 10 years after the Strange Fire Conference, they said. So at this point, there have been around 70 interviews and seven roundtable discussions filmed. At the end of 2020, they said we announced that we had plans to release American Gospel 3 in December of 2021. Due to multiple factors, which will be explained below, as they talk about, that that release will be pushed into 2023, hopefully by the end of the spring. First, COVID had created many delays and challenges in our ability to travel and film interviews. Second, the challenge of starting a streaming service with limited manpower has limited our ability to focus on working exclusively on the film. Third, because this film will cover the topic of the true person and work of the Holy Spirit compared to the Holy Spirit of the New Apostolic Reformation, there has been significant delay due to Bethel Church in Reading and their recent Rediscover Bethel series released in June of 2021. Bethel essentially 
actually responded to some of the critiques brought up in AG1 Christ Alone and released hours of content responding to common critiques of their theology and practices. We value truth and integrity in our filmmaking, so we decided that these videos needed to be thoroughly reviewed and responded to in order to present what Bethel teaches in the fairest way. And again, this is from their website. Now, I would also like to acknowledge that they have taken time and great effort to interview those on the opposite side of the aisle and who disagree with the critique of this movement while presenting it in a fair and objective light. So I don't know if this deliverance movie has any dissenting interviews in it. I do have strong concerns about the release of the movie, Come Out in Jesus' Name, because of the teaching surrounding deliverance ministry and the implications of these practices. And though it is fair to critique public ministries in light of scripture rightly understood, it would not be fair for me to make critiques about a film yet to be released, let alone in such a way that I act as the world would do. So having said that, I think that this also applies to Pagani's post. It's not fair for him to make these remarks about this. And it seems as if he didn't take time to go on the website to read the description because this is not an attack on charismatics. And so to make the statement that a docuseries yet to be released is bloviating about charismatics is disingenuous. As this implies, what will be said is lengthy, inflated, and empty. And a movie about deliverance is not a proportionate response to this project. It is also not about charismatics as a whole which that was the thing that I that I noticed. And I was actually, this post was brought to my attention. I was not surfing and looking for it on the internet. I had people sending it to me and saying, did you see this? Look what this says. I got to say, uh, when I saw it, I thought instantly, he has no idea what it's about because he, he hasn't read the description. This is not an on a full-on uh, attack or anything on any particular individual or person. This is to critique and to scrutinize the movement called the New Apostolic Reformation in the hyper-charismatic movement. This is not a full-on assault on the charismatics as a whole. There are people that have differing views on spiritual gifts, continuationists, Though I don't agree with their stance, they still have sound biblical theology that they hold to in certain areas that we would agree on that are fundamental and foundational. But when you start talking about the hyper-charismatic movement and the New Apostolic Reformation, there are serious concerns and questions and teachings that are within this, and they are worth looking at, and this is the focus. And there are many of us in this docuseries, including myself, that were affiliated with this for a number of years. So are we bloviating? Are we talking empty words that have yet to be heard, except in little sound bites for a few seconds? Um, I think that we need to be fair on both sides of the aisle and be willing if we're going to critique an entire project to watch it and to test it against scripture, not test it with our emotions and test it uh, as, as far as wh- how we feel about something, but always be willing to go back, well, what does Scripture has to say, have to say on this matter? Because Scripture has the final say. It has the final say in the proper context. So I know that this has been, as always, a longer episode, and this is a little bit longer. There's been a lot of information packed in this, but I felt it was necessary to share all this with you and to give you some food for thought, because a lot of us have not been familiar with the the history of deliverance ministry. We're always hearing deliverance ministers say, well, this was the ministry of Jesus, but you will need to look at that in context. Why is this word... The word dimonosomai, for example, is only mentioned 13 times, and that's in the Gospels. And I believe it's either four or six of those that it's referring to the the demonized men in the Gadarenes. It's not mentioned in the epistles. This is not something that you find in the epistles. And there's there's scholars that point to the fact that there was elevated and increased demonic activity in the time of Jesus because he had come into his earthly ministry as truly God and truly man and to fulfill what God had purposed him to do from the foundations of the earth. And so taking all of this into consideration, I think it's vital that we as believers are willing to do the the footwork and the Bible work to make sure that we have proper biblical understanding, proper historical context, that, that we understand scripture exegetically. And that we are always testing things to make sure that they are testifying of Christ uh, in spirit and truth and in, in in the context of his word. And as we end today, I want to point back to scripture in encouraging us as believers in Christ 
and the hope we have as believers who are sojourners in this world while we look to our eternal hope in Christ that awaits each of us. We need to be encouraged by scripture. The Bible is there to help us to know what God has spoken. And it's the truth. And we can rest in it. We can take comfort in it. We can be challenged by it. We can be encouraged by it. And we can trust that it has the instruction in it that we need that's necessary in order for us to grow in spiritual maturity. And so I want to encourage you and encourage myself in the scripture, which is silent on the matter of Christians having indwelling demons, that it is not silent on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, we find Paul saying to the, uh, the believers in Ephesus, and we can be encouraged by this when we read it, says, In him you also, when you heard the, ho- the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 is a passage that I've read several times when I've talked about deliverance ministry. It is always encouraging for us to hear it because it tells us the truth about the promises that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, in our salvation in saying that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. First John 4, 4 is another reminder to us as believers in Christ to encourage us in this world that as John reminds the believers and encourages them so we can be encouraged when he says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Our battle with the demonic is outward. It is not inward. How is there hope in Christ and being sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption if we have to worry about demons indwelling us by man's doctrine of, quote, legal right? You belong to God. If you are a born-again believer and you have placed your faith in Christ alone to save you and you have received him as your Lord and Savior, then you belong to God. You are made to glorify God in every area of your life, to love him in every area of your life, to glorify God in your body. And you and I cannot do this without his spirit indwelling us. And we cannot know God's ways without abiding in his word. Sin is the problem. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer. Proper biblical discipleship is the answer. Understanding progressive sanctification is the answer. If the apostles who were chosen by Jesus Christ and who authored scripture by the leading of the Holy Spirit did not see the need to address the issue of demons indwelling born-again believers, leaving the Bible silent on the matter, perhaps we should stop following and giving an ear to those who teach otherwise. I hope that this has encouraged you and helped you and challenged you today. And I hope that you will continue to be a student of the word, be a good Berean, and always be willing to go and to spend the extra time to study the word of God and to study the context and to have a better grasp on what other history, the church history and and such that is going on so that you can be more equipped to have these conversations with others. If you've enjoyed this podcast or if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at dawn at lovesickscribe.com. And if you enjoy this podcast and find it helpful, I hope that you'll consider leaving a five-star review. I look forward to being on with you here next week as we continue to dig into the word of God and to understand more clearly what scripture has to say on matters that we may have had questions about in the past. And until then, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.